as marketers, I, we don't spend enough time, I think, marketing our marketing. Welcome to Growth Driver, where the best minds in B2B are redefining growth. Hello, everyone. John Common here. So glad you're joining us here on Growth Driver. Okay. Everyone, and I mean everyone, is talking lately about how the old B2B growth playbook isn't working anymore. And it's time to learn a smarter, more efficient, new B2B growth playbook. We all see it. We all feel it. If you do B2B growth, you know this. But what are the real differences, like really, between the old and the new playbook? And how do you actually make that shift? That is what today's show is all about. And we're going to bring some structure and some rigor to this conversation. We're going to do a point-by-point pillar by pillar analysis of the old playbook and the new playbook. I am not going to do this alone today. I have the perfect guest with me on this topic, and I want to brag about him in front of his own face. Let me tell you about him. His name's John Miller. You probably already know this guy. He's the real deal, okay? He's a MarTech entrepreneur, a growth executive, a B2B and go-to-market thought leader. I would bet you a dollar that you've seen him speak at a conference you've been at, and I'd be willing to bet you $5 that you've benefited from content that John has created. He's the CMO of Demandbase. He co-founded Marketo and helped guide it to a successful IPO. He was the CEO and founder of Engageo that merged with Demandbase. He has literally helped build this category we call tech-enabled, growth-focused B2B marketing. Welcome to the show, John. Well, thank you for having me, John. You are really the perfect guest for this because, from my perspective, you are one of the true co-authors of what we now lovingly call the old playbook that needs to be updated. And you helped write that playbook when you were at Marketo. And you've also been working, from my perspective, iterative, iteratively developing the new playbook at Demandbase. So I guess the first question that I want to dive in with you uh, is why has the old playbook become obsolete? What forces are driving the need for a new playbook, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny. I mean, you would think with all this new stuff, right? It's ABX, it's Nearbound, it's, you know, or before that we had social and mobile and, you know, content. And it, like, there's always some new thing, right? You would think it would be, we, we would be doing better than ever before. Right. Right. <laughs> you would think like, oh yeah, we're all making all of our pipeline numbers all the time. And it's easy because we have all this amazing new tech and all this amazing new methodologies. And, and it's, it's, that's not the case, you know? And I think it's not the case because there's some pretty fundamental, I, I think disconnects in kind of how we've been thinking about the go-to-market and admittedly how I used to talk about it. You know, so, I mean, we could, we could spend a lot of time on all the disconnects, but I think there's, there's uh, three I want to highlight. You know, the, the first is, you know, buyers have gotten pretty indifferent to the traditional tactics. You know, they, they've learned if, you know, they might want that ebook, but if they fill out that form to download it, they're going to start getting a bunch of stuff they don't want, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and, and you know, yeah. So what? So what do marketers and SDRs do? We just start sending more stuff, right? And it creates this like vicious circle. Yeah. Um, and as a result, I think the buyers have really rotated towards how can they be more anonymous? How can they do more of their research? Um, either you know not filling out a form on our website or by going to uh, third party sites, you know, dark dark sites, you know, you name it if you will. Right. And that loses. You know, part part of the original playbook from Marketo was the ability to cookie somebody and track them and score them accordingly. And you know, so buyer difference means people don't want you know, are, aren't responding, and we've lost visibility. I, I think that the second trend is that, um, and we're going to talk about this, but the the traditional playbook has really overly focused marketing. I think on pipeline generation at the expense of thinking about, you know, the end revenue, like, you know, could those same marketing dollars be better spent improving win rates? 
you know, or accelerating pipeline. Um, and that's not how marketers have been trained to think. That's not how marketers have been paid to think. Right. And then the third one, which I've been getting a lot of, I think, positive feedback on social about, you know, in the last you know six months or so, is the traditional model is so focused on marketing that's highly measurable. It means that we have started, you know, basically underinvested in uh, brand building, you know, which is obviously less measurable, you know, and so as a result, you know. There's research, you know, Ehrenberg Bass Institute says 5% of our ICP is in market at any given point in time. LinkedIn says it's 1%, you know, wh whatever. If it's one, it's right. five. The point is, it's not, most of it isn't. It's not and 50. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the problem with highly measurable demand gen marketing is it tends to rotate all of our marketing onto that 5%. That's right. You know, which is the same 5% our competitors are fighting against. And we're ignoring that 95%. You know, we've lost the art of building our brand Yeah, in many yeah. ways. And I think something that a lot of marketers don't give enough credit to is the fact that a strong brand makes your demand perform better. And the vice versa is true. A weaker brand means your demand performs worse. You know, back in the days of Marketo, you know, everybody wanted to sort of, you know, hear my secret sauce. How did we have such amazing demand generation results? Right. And the reality is part of the reason we had all those amazing demand generation results is we had a great brand. That's right. And I had That's right. I, yeah. I, I was in your, literally, I was one of your, I was your persona, man. One of yeah. your personas. And I remember year after year, month after month being the recipient of the full spectrum of Marketo's then go to market strategy. Yep. And sure, the, I recall it being um, heavily weighted toward what we would call active demand, people who are in market or near being in market. But I also remember, and people conveniently forget this part of your playbook. I'm kind of defending you a little bit. Um, there, um, you championed marketing. Remember that? Like, mm -hmm. I, I remember right. being at your show, but I, but I, I remember Marketo stood for something. Yeah. You know, and and that is brand. That totally, totally. Yeah. You know, uh, brand is what people think about you when you're not in the room. It's the one or two words that are, that kind of yeah. are the associations that get built. You know, and and so this you know, 15 years of focusing our marketing on stuff that's measurable has led to across the board, I think, weaker performance for all of our demand gen because the brand has sort of suffered accordingly. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to dig into that. Um, I, I would offer two other accelerants to the three major trends. Why we need a new playbook? You just mentioned three. Uh, I don't know what you think about this, but I would say what has accelerated that is all of the tool buying we did. We made things more complex, but I'm not sure we uh, uh, made things better with with the million with the explosion of tools. That's number one. Uh, and, and and I would say in some cases those tools aided and abetted. Um, bad practices, right? MA, MAP, sales engagement platform, the misuse of those two in particular. Um, you, you may or may not believe that or agree with that. But the second one is um, uh, the end of zero interest rate policy <laughs> has come along and said, and now you must be efficient. And I think yeah. that has pantsed, so to speak, the, the inefficiency of the old playbook in most companies. So for all those reasons, I think it is time to take a hard look at your growth playbook. So what we're going to do basically for the rest of this episode is John and I have kind of laid out, look, there are probably 12, 15 pillars of a complete playbook, but we're going to zone, zone in, home in on eight key pillars of any decent B2B playbook. I'm going to tee up the pillar. I'm going to tee up a little bit about what the old version of the playbook looks relative to that component of the playbook. And then John, I'll hand you the microphone and we can talk about what does new look like and what might be some advice mm -hmm. or some warnings as you're moving from old to new in that specific area. So pillar number one, growth goals and priorities, right? So every good playbook has, is, is built on certain components. A critical one, what we hope would be growth goals and priorities. So in the old playbook, I think it has tended to be extremely acquisition focus in its goals and its priorities. I think in the, in the area of how companies set their growth goals, I think it's been fairly uh, high level. And the classic example is 
the CEO walks out of the board meeting with a spreadsheet that says, we're going to grow 30% year over year. And he drops it off to the go-to-market team and they go, okay, uh, where? So I guess just new logos, is that what we're going to do? So I think, I think that's a piece. And then the last piece I would sort of criticize of the old playbook is the connection between corporate strategy, truly corporate strategy, constraints, budget constraints, priorities, and the, how that connects and guides go-to-market strategy has been relatively weak, right? So I think yep. that the board has said, here's our corporate strategy. And then the CMO, the CRO, the chief product officer get it. They're not necessarily talking about it together and they're kind of figuring it out as they go along. So that's my tee up of growth goals and priorities, old playbook. What does the new playbook look like, do you think? <clears throat> now, let, let me just pull that thread for one second. Cause I mean, there's something I think that's that resonates with me, you know, as a marketer who's been in the seat. Yeah. Um, you know, like like many companies, you know, demand based, you know, we set you set the bookings goals that sets sales targets, and then we have a very sophisticated model, you know, that knows, well, okay, based on win rates and deal velocities and our current pipeline, here's the pipeline numbers we need to create. Mm -hmm. I think something that's a disconnect that has happened in my past, um, and I had to work to change the company's thinking was you know, when that when we do that exercise and that exercise comes back with an unrealistic pipeline number, right. you know, most executives' response is, oh, just figure it out, marketing. That's what I mean. You know, That's right. um, and, it's and, and then the marketers end up just be like, uh, okay, we'll do our best job here, <laughs> you know, but like, don't be surprised come, you know, September when we're missing the numbers because we can't create a pipeline. You know, and and that that you know, marketing needs to have the credibility to be part of that discussion. Yeah, and the planning does need to sort of be both a top down and a bottoms up. So I absolutely agree with what you're saying. You know, and your yeah. point. Yeah. Um, what about what about this? Do you do you agree that traditionally the old playbook has tended to over index on acquisition to the detriment of total enterprise growth, which requires that you retain your base and probably sell them something else that they would find delightful. Otherwise, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, two, two examples, you know, one, you know, I mean, at Marketo, it was so extreme, you know, that, uh, we used to ig ignore any response to a campaign from an existing customer, you know, like as we sort of looked at like, Hey, did that program drive, you know, good responses from the right people, right. <laughs> you know, literally, well, well that, those are our customers. They're not going to, we're not going to get pipe new, new pipeline from them. So, you know, take that out of the model. Yeah. I, we changed that eventually, but for a long time, that was, you know, the mindset, um, you know, at demand base, you know, we've had the strong focus on let's improve retention, like every company, you know, has had, you know, but then when it comes time to plan your marketing budget, you know what people do? They're like, well, here's the new bookings target. Right. Right. And well, that's right. grown 10%. So your budget will grow 8%. And we're like, well, what about corporate priority number one, which is drive retention, you know, and marketing can help with that, but it does require time and resources. Right. As you said, disconnect. Yeah. You know, well, so hundred percent. And then the I and then I alluded to something even just a little simpler earlier, which is just well, what about pipeline acceleration, improving yeah. win rates? Right. You know, marketers don't get you know compensated or judged on the, how their efforts improve those things. Mm -hmm. Marketers are judged on MQLs and pipeline creation, and again, that creates all sorts of weird incentives. Yeah. All right. So to round out this pillar one called growth goals and priorities, one piece of advice I would offer, and we do this with with our clients, um, uh, is um, you know, it seems so simple. So sometimes the most elegant solutions are very, very simple, but really commit to having the CMO, the CRO, the CEO, and the CFO in the room throughout the planning process where you break down and connect growth goals to budget realities and timing realities. I think that's where the, the inadvertent corporate delusion occurs. It, I think it's exacerbated by siloed planning, siloed budgeting. So I think there, there's no silver bullets, but you can make this part of your playbook better if you at least get in the same room and be like, 
if I accelerate or raise this particular growth goal above another one, that means you have to do something different or do something less. Do you agree? And yep. that doesn't happen very often in companies. It doesn't. No, I mean, there's I, there's going to be a theme, I think, that goes through a bunch of these trends as we talk about it. Yeah. You know, which is at the core, it comes down to kind of marketing's credibility, you know, and marketing's respect to kind of engage in these conversations. Like when we talk about brand, right? I mean, if, in order to increase investment on brand, at the end of the day, it's a little bit of like, hey, trust me, I like, you know, like this isn't going to be measurable in the same way as the other stuff we've measured, but yeah. it will, you know, and, and so the question is, you know, I used to preach marketing credibility and respect by tying everything you do to those pipeline dollars. And now we're sort of saying, well, it's the world's more complicated than that, right. you know, and you do need to maybe sometimes do things that improve retention or accelerate deals or just improve the brand. And when a marketing team can't tie those dollars directly, it's easier to think about cutting that budget. And so the, the best response, I mean, the best response is, I think the CMO's job is evolving to become one of more influence on the C-suite to advocate for these types of things that we're talking about. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and the best CMOs are going to be the ones who can really, you know, spend the time talking to their peers, moving the, you know, moving this conversation forward mm -hmm. in a way that's probably more about soft skills than it is, you know, look, I have the ROI of this thing down to the last degree. Yeah. So that's going to be a theme, I think, as we talk about a bunch of these. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Let's find out. I, I agree. You, you kind of just teed up pillar two perfectly, which is pillar two of old playbook, new playbook is how does your playbook contemplate and manage the tension and the opportunity between brand and demand creation on one side versus demand capture and conversion on the other? And in the old playbook, we've already said it, but just in case you're keeping notes here, in the old playbook, there's a strong tendency to over-focus at the bottom of the funnel with demand capture, active demand, sales conversion. Um, th there has been a, <clears throat> I'm going to use the word neglect of reputation and brand building because of that. And I would say <clears throat> when companies uh, step away from their responsibility slash opportunity at the brand level, at the demand creation level, nature abhors a, va a vacuum. Do you think your buyers decide to not learn? They, they go learn from someone else. And they if they're not learning from you, they're not developing buying preferences. They're buying, developing those preferences somewhere. And if it ain't you, that's not good. So that's old playbook. I think the new playbook, you just, you said it a second ago, and I've heard you um, recently on LinkedIn say, hey, look, I recommend roughly, if you have a, if you need a starting spot, 40% of your budget should go into brand and 60% should go into demand, which is probably their jaws falling on the floor right now. Cause they're like, oh my God, if I could only spend 40%. <laughs> on brand, but whether it's 40 or 30 or 20 or whatever, or 50, how, what's a piece of advice you would give to that CMO who's walking in to a meeting with CEO, CFO for how to have the trust, the rigor, the gravitas to pull off them saying, well, you know what? I, I'm going to approve you spending that money on brand. I think if that's the first conversation, you're in trouble, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, that conversation happens after the last six months of talking to them about marketing, about how marketing, you know, actually affects buying, how buying has changed, where, you know, where things are, you know, and, and then finally, you know, almost like in a perfect world, Socratically, all right, well, what should we do about this, Mrs. CEO? Right. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, and they're like, well, we probably need to improve some of that brand stuff, <laughs> like, you know, and, and that, th that's the point I'm saying, like, th th it's a different set of skills for the CMO, I think, to sort of, you know, talk about these. Now, a couple things I want to point out. A lot of brand investments take a long time to pay back. Um, and right. that is weird in a world where the average tenure of a CMO is just over two years. Right? You know, does that mean that, you know, the brand investments you do today are going to, actually pay off for the person after you most you know, cmos most cmos are a one-term president 
you know? Right. So, you, you uh, know, so you be careful about, you know, the great society. If you're going to push that through Congress, you might not be there. Right. Yeah. yeah, totally. You know, and it's I mean, it's ironic that, you know, most CMOs, what's the first thing they do is they change the brand. Right. You know, that, and so, you know, there, there, there's some, you know, again, there's some ch ch change, thinking changing that needs to yeah. happen here. In these days of efficient growth, throwing siloed tactics at your growth goals is not going to get it done. So what will work? Aligned go-to-market strategy that guides the right integrated growth motions. If you need a partner who understands how to build that strategy and then help you execute it at a very, very high level, go to intelligentdemand.com, book a meeting with an expert growth consultant. They'd love to talk to you. You said, don't, if the first time, if the first thing that comes out of your mouth is I'm going to need 40% for brand, um, that is called a career limiting move. <laughs> but instead you said, educate over time and, and, and say, Hey, don't, don't hate the messenger. This is how our buyer buys. This is where they go for information. This is how, what percentage are in market at any given time. This is what percent are already under contract in a three-year contract and aren't going to come up. This is our ICP. Now you tell me, where do you want to play? Because if we only focus on hot burning active demand, there are roughly X hundred accounts that we're going to have to go out there with a knife fight and our competitors and try to win. Or we can use a portfolio approach to our investment yep. strategy, right? That's really the, important. The, here's the tricky part, right? Let's just say you really want to move to, let's say a two thirds, one third, yeah. you know, split brand yeah. and demand. You know, nobody in the world is going to suddenly get 50% more budget to sort of make that work, right? right? You're going to have to take investment away from the demand, you know, and this is the CMO has to get comfortable with this. Take, you know, I'm going to take money away from the demand and move it to, to brand, which is going to break every assumption you've had around how do your pipeline, how do dollars translate into pipeline? Right. You, I guarantee you, most people listening have some model, you know, that says, all right, in order to generate a hundred million of pipeline, I need a $10 million budget. Yeah. You know, um, and, and in order to really embrace this, like buying is different. I'm going to put some money in brand. You got to get to the place where you believe you're going to generate that hundred million on 6 million of demand and investment because it's going to get lifted by that 4 million of less measurable brand that you did. That's right. That's so right. So it's, it's really both educating your peers, but also you got to believe it yourself. <laughs> you know, oh, this is good. I knew, I knew we were going to have a good conversation and can I, so I'm going to end what you did. Yes. Great. And I think part of the solution lies in the next pillar, which is how do you define your target audience? So the old playbook, tended to go, when it came to target audience, the old playbook tended to say, hmm, my go-to-market is go to TAM, or my go-to-market is go to these top five market segments that contain these generic personas. But I'm teeing you up, man. This is one of your sweet spots. But like, um, you want to get more efficient, take a fresh, more rigorous look at how you define your target audience. So talk to us about what the new playbook looks like when it comes to target audience. Well, I, I think ultimately it does come down to understanding where your potential buyers are in their buying journey mm -hmm. and then adjusting your marketing with the right message accordingly. Mm -hmm. Let's break down. What, what does that mean? Yeah. Right. So, you know, we're going to market to 100 percent of the audience, not the 5 percent that's in market. But part of it is let's identify that 5 percent, You know, make sure we know who they are you know, and make sure we are engaging with them in a really kind of tiered and appropriate way. But now for the other 95%, right, we're yeah. building our brand with that, right? Well, and, and, but, but isn't the other 95, don't you think, don't you think that most companies are going after a total relevant market? We, you and I would probably call it an ICP. Either they don't have one or it is far too broad. And because they are focusing on a too broad of a number of accounts or size of alleged target market, it's forcing them to spend brand or demand resources on accounts that are like, dude, they're not going to choose you. Why are you wasting the time and money? 
Well, or, or even maybe they would choose you, but it's going to be, you know, half as efficient to get them as somebody else. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Yeah. You know, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I was, I was going to get to that. I mean, so, you know, ultimately if we're going to be identifying the people in market, we're going to be building brand with the, with the rest. We have to recognize we can't do that for every possible account. Okay. Okay. You know, and yeah. so you do need to have a really, I think, intelligent process for choosing how you're going to refine you know, refine that focus. Yeah. You know, and a lot of companies will just do a target account, not target account. You know, uh, I actually think there is a lot of value into doing it with some tiering, tier one, tier two, tier three, non-target. Hmm. Um, and, and again, don't just, but, but really watch the, don't pick too many, you know? Um, and that's so hard for marketers. We've been trained to think about volume, right? We've been trained, to, you know, to think, well, I got to touch everybody and I got to do this. And like, you know, but, but the whole idea is when you have fewer dollars and fewer resources, you've got to re focus them better on the ones that are going to have that highest, highest impact. And I, I think in this pillar lies a big chunk of how that CMO says, in, in return for having the ability to go invest in brand, I have to spend less on demand. How can I do that? And I think part of the answer is in this is what you're talking about. And yeah. Is, yep. While we're talking about target audience, do you have even 30 or 45 seconds for for about how we should be thinking about um, buying teams, not just personas, not just accounts, but that sweet spot in the middle buying mm -hmm. teams? Yeah. So tip, typically, uh, we've talked, you know, in, in, in the ABM world or in the account focused world, we're like, well, it's all about the account. It's the account that buys, not the person. And we recognize that we need to look at the account to really understand the signals of what's going on because any one person doesn't really give you the signal. But the reality is the accounts are too big. You know, if, le if leads are too narrow, accounts are too broad, especially for any business that has where you, you, you uh, one account could represent more than one selling opportunity, which is most common for large enterprises that have multiple products. You know, product, you know, they're sure they're a customer for product one. You know, but they're just a prospect for product too. And the problem with ABM by itself is you just say, well, that account is a customer, you know, and you miss the, the nuance of kind of what's going on. So the sophistication of the new playbook, you know, is to be thinking about your account selection and your understanding where buyers are, not at the lead basis, not at the account basis, but on that buying group basis. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Pillar four is how, whether old playbook or new book, we, we have to make decisions about how, what channels we will use to engage our buyers and what kind of buying behavior we encounter when we engage them with those channels. So old playbook says, engage your audience with our websites, with email, with corporate social feeds, and then try to engage them in those channels with what I would call either kind of corporate focused brand focused content or bottom of funnel product focused content. Um, I think another traditional or old playbook uh, engagement channel uh, aspect is really expecting paid media to do a whole hell of a lot of heavy lifting when it comes to awareness and demand um, to the exclusion of non-paid channels. Um, I think the old playbook is extremely reliant on interruptive outbound SDR and I think the old playbook doesn't leverage intent data the way that it could or should. So that's me beating up on the old playbook. So if that's how the old playbook thinks about engagement channels and buyer behavior, what does the new playbook start to look like? What does yep. it take encounter and take take consideration? Yeah, I guess I first I want to take one second to defend the old playbook. <laughs> because <laughs> you know, Fair. as I practice this at Marketo. You know, the content was not meant to be, you know, about us and about the product and all that. You know, I always preach the content just needs to be educational or entertaining for the target personas. And I think what's happened is a bastardization, you know, of that playbook, you know, where people ended up doing, you know, what you're what you just talked about and lost sight of the fact that, you know, this con, you know, the, 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 you build your brand on content. Of course, that's, I mean, that's what works in B2B, you know, 
Um, but the, the content kind of needs to change, you know, needs to change. Well, and, but defend, I, just to give you a character witness, I could literally go open up my copy of the definitive guide to lead nurturing from that era that yeah. I think you authored. And yeah. that would, that was, you were not selling Marketo in that guide. So, so to your point. Absolutely. But now that, so now let's talk about old playbook versus new playbook. Yeah, Cause yeah, the old right. playbook was go write a definitive guide. You know, go write this like awesome ebook that was like full of rich media information that was educational and hopefully entertaining to the target audience. New playbook, nobody wants to download a, a big ebook anymore. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know, um, I mean, I wrote this one at Demand Base. You know, How many pages playbook. was that thing? It was like 60 pages. The nurturing one or the Demand Base one? Yeah, the nurturing one. The nurturing. The original one was about 40. And over the years, my, my definitive guides have gotten bigger. My most recent one at Demand Base is 200 pages. Just write a book, John. You already did. <laughs> it is a book. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, and the reality is like, I mean, this, this, this latest one from the man base, I would say is my best book yet in terms of the quality of the content. Hmm. And it's been hard to get people to download it. Yeah. Um, and that's your point. So, You're saying that the old long form content on a thing that you read is and not to put, put words in your mouth, but I think that's where you're. Yeah. Yeah. Well, especially the gated ebook, mm. you know, which has, was, I would say the, the, the core pillar of old playbook thought leadership. So I think new playbook, there's, there's really two things that um, I think companies are doing that is uh, innovative and kind of, you know, going to help stand out. The first one is, you know, executives, there's, oh, there's some research I just saw on the other day on this one. Um, but it, it was that executives, um, I'm not going to find an exact quote, but are, are looking for, you know, they're not looking for like the pundit who is just sharing like, hey, here are 10 best practices for B2B marketing. <laughs> they're looking for proprietary insights and research that only your company can provide. And, you know, a lot of companies have done this for years with like surveys and other kinds of research studies. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think the gold standard that I've seen is what Gong has done with Gong Labs, you know, and their ability to use machine learning to actually mine all these call recordings across all of their customers. I agree. And create real useful, valuable insights for sellers. Like when should you swear in a sales call? You know, and what words are the best words to bring up pricing? And like, literally, they have the data that tells you that. Well, you know, honestly, you know what that sounds like to me in my ears? It's turning your go-to-market into a product itself. It's leveraging your market position. Sure. Yeah. Although saying it's a product implies you might be selling it or something. And, and, no, you know, and I, I, think, I, just, I think the point is you're giving away value. That's my point. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, you know, I think a trend is more companies can and should be, you know, really thinking about how am I going to mine my unique insights and data to produce content or, you know, literally research that nobody else can produce. Yeah. Um, wow. the other trend that I see people just starting to talk about and shout out to Anthony Canada from audience plus for being really the champion for this. But sort of moving, you know, instead of moving away from gated content and moving more towards building our own audiences, you know, and communities, you know, which can be as simple as come to my website and just like when you go to the New York Times, you register to read the stuff, you know, you're going to come to my site and you're going to register to kind of, you know, access all my great content, but none of it's gated. You're just registering to kind of, you know, get to it. It's a slightly subtle, different mindset. Hmm. But, you know, I think the goal is, you know, how do we be producing the quality content that, you know, people will sort of say, sure, I will register to be part of that audience. And then you get into like the brand associations of being part of an audience. Like if you're doing a really good job, people will want access to your merch um, and, and things like that. And then when, you've, when you're succeeding there, you've built a brand. Yeah. Hmm. That's really good. Uh, anything about anonymous buying dark funnel implications I mean, of that? I mean, I mean, ultimately you, you know, you, you know, your buyers are there, you know? Right. And so how are you going to kind of, you know, be part of that conversation? Um, 
I think the the things we just talked about can help. The, I guess there's one other tactic, which is we did a demand base that was really successful, you know, which was we paid for our best advocates to be members of some of these private communities, like Pavilion. You know, it's not cheap to join Pavilion, you know, but, you know, our 10 or 15 best champions all got memberships sponsored by demand base. And we're not telling them what to write on that thing. But you know what? If there's a thread that's saying, hey, which is the best ABM platform? We're at least going to tell them, hey, there's a thread. Maybe you can comment on it. Yeah. You right. know, and that's that was a very effective tactic for, you know, I think just kind of, you know, tying in, uh, into some of these dark communities. Yeah. So to mobilize your advocates. Yeah. To, I love that. And to, just to round out this pillar of in, how do you engage your market and what kind of buying behavior will you encounter when you do? I think what the, the piece of advice I'm taking and, and sharing is. We, it's time we need to open the aperture when we think about channels of engagement and, and like what you what you just said is a really great example of that it's like think much more creatively much more broadly about how you reach your target audience beyond the traditional paid channels and outbound SDR touch your website yes those are still the workhorses maybe yeah but there's so many more um, okay maybe if I can just make one other kind of little bit of a sort of non sequitur point but something I realized that we haven't kind of gotten to. You said a, a while ago that, you know, for a lot of companies, display has sort of been the workhorse of brand building. Um, and, you know, I think the problem is that, um, you know, display is a brand building medium and not a demand generation medium. And when people start putting click here buttons on their ads, right, they are just exactly doing the wrong thing. So whether it's whether it's display advertising or any other kind of brand building, remember that you're you're speaking to the reptilian brain. You're trying to connect to the amygdala where emotions live and not logic. You know, and 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 you we have to adjust how how we think about our message and our creative accordingly. And that's an art that has been I think largely lost from B2B in the world of the traditional playbook. Yeah, it's it, it's a casualty of over-indexing on bottom of funnel. I, mean, I yeah, couldn't agree exactly. more. Pillar five, data. In the old playbook, our use of data, sure, it was primarily first-party data that we have gathered through websites, through events, through forms. Old playbook still was buying lists of dubious recency and quality. Old playbook had disconnected data sets. The obvious disconnection is marketing data versus sales data, but it was even worse and more disconnected than that. Disconnected by funnel stage, disconnected by platform. That which leads to another aspect of the old playbook, which is there, there was absolutely no single view of the prospect or the customer or the account because we did not integrate that data. So what does new playbook look like in the pillar of data? So, you know, this one I think is really just about supporting the other things that we've said. You know, like like the core strategy is, A, we need to focus our resources onto the accounts that are really worth, most worth our time and resources. And then B, we need to be able to understand where the buying groups at those accounts are in their unique journeys. So we can adjust things accordingly. If you just say, well, those are the two things I need to accomplish. The question is, what kind of account intelligence gives me those insights? Mm -hmm. You know, and that is not go to the Zoom info and just buy a list of contacts, right? Yeah, but, need... but is it is it is it go spelunking with a f cross your fingers and go do an enormous multi year CDP project? Like, what is the answer? Um, well, you know, maybe to oversimplify it, you know, I always have liked the FIRE acronym here hmm. just as a way for people to sort of think about, you know, kind of how to break this down. Yeah, please. So FIRE, the F stands for fit, you know, and this is the kind of firmographic data that tells you, is this a company you're going to be interested in? Typically, that's, you know, industry, company size, location. But interestingly, at least for technology companies at demand base, we have found that the number one predictor of fit is the existing tech stack. Hmm. You know, what, yeah. what if you know if you said if you sell technology, what other technologies does that company own? Sure. Um, so that gives you a type of data that you need. 
you know, if you're a tech company, you probably need accurate technographics data. The I in FIRE stands for intent. And this is partly playing off of that loss of traditional lead scoring that I talked about earlier, right? right? You know, you, know, you want to know if somebody's hot, but we no longer can tell, you know, because, you know, by tracking them on our website, they're doing their research elsewhere, you know, and that's all anonymous. We don't know who that, you know, what people are doing off on our website, but we, but companies don't have a right to privacy. People do. And so we are able to sort of aggregate at the company level, what's happening out on the open web and use that to create insight and signals. Got it. That's become, you know, of possible because of big data and machine learning. And, and interestingly, people don't talk about this a lot, but there's two kinds of intent data. You know, there's, there's your, your average level of interest in a topic. You know, and you can kind of think about like, that's your bank account balance. You know, or if you're a math person, like that's the level where you are. And then there's spikes or the rate of change, the first derivative or your income statement for whatever analogy you want. You know, and, and interestingly, the, the base level is a pretty good indication of whether or not that account, it should be interesting to you. Like all, you know, cause an account that tends to be interested in your topics is a better account than one that isn't. And it's the spikes that is what tells you they're moving into the 5%. So being a little more nuanced about how we think about intent data, um, the R in fire that stands for relationship. Um, this one is, is squishy as data for some companies, but it's really context and history. You know, like, and sometimes that's your CRM opportunity data. Have you sold to them in the past? You know, et cetera. Um, there is, there are interesting data sources that help you track how people move across companies over time. So a great source of data is if you had somebody who was a customer at one company and now have they moved to another company. Boomerang. And then the E is engagement. And this is, you know, based on a belief that I have that before somebody spends money with you, they spend time with you. And so can you track, are they spending time with you? Are they coming to your website? Are they responding to your campaigns? And again, we may not know the individuals because of this anonymity we talked about, but we can aggregate it and roll it up at least at the account level. So you can combine these four ingredients, I think, to sort of do those two main things we talked about. Who should I be going after? And when are they entering that 5% ready market? I'm so glad you brought the FIRE acronym and the FIRE concept back up. I, it, it, I'm bringing the FIRE, man. You re, dude, you bring the FIRE. But the, it's, when, did you, when did you first bring that? It, it, three years, four years ago? But it's still very relevant. It's, an, it's a great framework. Well, I cannot claim credit for authoring it. Um, who, who like that? many great ideas, I've uh, appropriated them from others. Um, I first saw that being used by a company called Everstring. Oh, I remember Everstring. Yeah. <clears throat> well... Props to Everstring. I know we all know some great people that came from there. Um, Matt you know, Amundsen was their head of marketing. Great yeah, guy. He, he's, he's totally great. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Okay, pillar six of the old to the new playbook. <sighs> Everybody, stand up, get some fresh air. We're, we're, we're almost there. Pillar six is the roles played by sales and marketing. Role clarity. Who does what and how do they orchestrate? So mm -hmm. old playbook. You know this, man. You know this. It's a cliche because it's been so painfully true. Old playbook, sales and marketing are in a relay race, working in a silo. Marketing's up at top of funnel. SDR and field marketing are kind of in the middle. Sales at the bottom of the funnel and CS is on an island. And everybody's giving lip service about alignment and they do trust falls at the SKO and they can't orchestrate their way out of a wet paper sack. So that's the old playbook. What does sales and marketing role clarity responsibilities look like in the new playbook? Yeah, well, so I think a much better analogy in the new world is a soccer or for some of our overseas friends, a football team. Um, you know, you ultimately, the, the, there are, you have players in different positions, right? There are forwards and there are fullbacks. Um, but they are going to pass the ball back and forth mm -hmm. uh, as they move as a team to achieve a goal. And one of the things I like to think about is like, follow the path the ball takes as it moves down the field. It's going to be a very nonlinear path. 
And I think that looks kind of like the path our buyer's journeys look like today. Uh, and so it's about people knowing their roles and playing their positions, but ultimately really working together. Mm -hmm. So now, how do you make that happen? Right. Right. Well, what does a good soccer team do? You know, and now I'm going to start mixing some sports analogies. But, you know, one of the things is they want to have as much kind of information sharing as possible. Right. Whether it's yelling out to each other, you know, or just kind of, I think, the, what they call field awareness. You know, and I think the best sales and marketing teams share a lot of information. Um, and then, you know, now switching to American football, just for, for a second, you know, what do you do before you run the play? You have a huddle. Uh, you have a play, for one. Sure. Well, all right. There is a playbook. <laughs> you know, fair enough. Right. You know, no, but um, I mean, I'm not being... No, no, you're right. right. You're right. You're yeah. right. You're right. Totally. Like, you know, presupposing that exists. You have a playbook. Yeah. Um, but then you have a huddle. And in in this new world, I mean, something I've seen some of the best companies do, Snowflake does this, for example, with their ABM program, is you have this like bi-weekly meeting, you know, with the sales rep and the marketer and the SDR, right? And it's five to ten minutes. It's a stand-up, and you're talking about that rep's accounts. Yeah. What's going on and what plays are we going to run? Yeah. And you know, it's, it's not rocket science, but it's so powerful. And now, you know, I know a lot of the customers listening work at pretty big companies and, you know, an objection sometimes I hear is like, well, we have hundreds of sales reps and there's just little old us in marketing. How can we do that? And what I try to coach people is we're talking about a 10 minute meeting every two weeks or maybe once a month. You can cover a lot more than you think you can. And the value is probably very little things, few things you can do that will have a better impact with your time. That's awesome. That's awesome. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, soccer, yeah. not really. Soccer, soccer yep. and football. Yep. Just, Which has a really good segue into our next pillar around metrics. Pillar seven, metrics, reporting, attribution, old playbook. Do I even need to say what the old playbook looks like? It's, it's, uh, you try to measure everything. You end up learning nothing. Old playbook is your, when you do measure shit, you tend to measure the wrong shit. It's leads, it's clicks, it's impressions. Um, you have been trained, unfortunately, by this B2B growth industry to ask and try to answer what was marketing sourced completely separate from sales sourced. And, uh, I think in the old playbook, uh, th this list, this, this is the one that, burns me on a weekly basis, John, is yep. um, executives who come to the go-to-market growth space and they go, which tactic, which single tactic is making me grow my company? I'm like, the problem is with the question, man. <laughs> so um, that's the old playbook. What does yeah. the new playbook look like? Yeah. I mean, can you imagine a soccer team that had, you know, two different scoreboards, you know, one for scores, from the forwards and one from the fullbacks, you know, like it's, it's absurd. And like, and they would never pass the ball back and forth, you know, or, you know, another analogy I used the other day is like, you know, trying to sort of give credit to a single tactic is like trying to give credit to the one raindrop that started a wave. Like, 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 like the buying is complex. There's, there are many buyers, there's many touches that are happening across the point. Those touches span marketing and sales. We've got to move away from that sort of, you know, tr trying to sort of use attribution to assign, you know, or give credit, you know, and, and instead, I think companies really want to focus on what I call, you know, just team-based metrics. Yeah. Um, you know, like what is the total pipeline goal? What is the revenue goal? What is the win rate? You know, and ultimately how together are we going to kind of make the, make all this work? People get really nervous about this one. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're like, well, but I have to have marketing sourced measure measures. So I know what's working or not working and, you know, which team, you know, do I blame or, you know, or, or whatnot? I, I go back to the sports analogy. There's one scoreboard you win or lose as a team. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you don't review game tape, right? You, you can still look at individuals performance, but you're not doing it to prove the value. You're doing it to improve the performance. And that's how we should be thinking about using attribution. 
right? It's not a something that's accurate down to like the nth degree. ROI was 18.2%. It's about this worked better than that. We should do more of this and less of that. You know, and 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 changing our mindsets accordingly, I think are 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 you know pretty essential for success here. Dear listener, what John Miller just said <laughs> is use your metrics reporting and attribution to improve your I would call them go to market plays or go to market motions, not to prove the value of your left leg versus your right leg. Like how, how did you get how did you get to a touchdown and took both of your legs, took all of your body, <laughs> right? So you do, well which leg got the credit? The body got the credit, right? And I think that's so true. Um and I also want to pull on a thread, so to speak, on one more thing. You know, I'm a CEO. You've been a CEO. Knowing you, you're going to be a CEO, I don't know, six hours from now. But um, uh, I don't think it's that CEOs are dumb or CFOs are dumb. And they're like, oh, I can't contemplate the fact that B2B growth is a team sport. I think they know that. But I think that the reason they sweat us into – marketing versus sales source just because they're looking for that accountability. And again, go play, go back 60 seconds in this podcast and listen to what you said, John, because I think what you said is, no, no, watch the game tape. The way that a team achieves a goal is the combined efforts of each player. And yes, you're allowed to hold each player accountable, but it's in service to the play goal. Am I, am I picking up what you're putting down? No, that's exactly right. You know, the other thing that kind of you know, kicks in here is people are like, oh, but I have to, I you know, but I have to have marketing source, you know, versus sales sourced, you know, and back to you, like, you take two legs to score the goal. Like, you have to recognize that will always be false, right? Like, it will, like, it, that is not the way buying works, you know, and, and so, you know, as I'm, I'm trying to, you know, help the CMOs and the other marketers who are listening, how do you convince the rest of your executives to move to this world of team-based pipeline, you know, or team-based metrics. It's by, again, showing like, like, you know, it is never true that it is sourced solely by one. Here's yeah. the data to, to indicate that that's not true. So why would we spend time and energy trying to figure out this false thing when that has the only implication of hurting the teamwork that we're trying to create? It's true. We, we took, we took one ICP, one closed one deal with a client of ours, a technology client of ours last year. And we did the hard work with them of spelunking through all of their various systems to identify from the very beginning, top of the funnel, all the way through closed one, what were the marketing touches, the SDR touches, and the sales touches. And we mapped it and then showed it at the SKO on a huge screen. And you know what it showed? Exactly what you said. Oh, wait a minute. Marketing was involved. I don't know. It was like, it was like an appalling, it was like 780 touches or something. I don't know. Uh -huh. And SDR, it was soup to nuts. It was not at the top of the funnel. It was across the whole damn thing. SDRs were small but powerful pivotal moments. And the sales was also engaged a lot in the middle and a ton at the bottom. But it, 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 it was the soccer play that you talked about. Um, so just... If, if you're wondering if it happens in the real world, I've seen it happen in the real world. So, okay, we have now arrived at pillar eight, <clears throat> the last of our eight pillars. Old playbook, new playbook relative to technology platforms and tools. So in the old playbook, in my opinion, we had a decade of a total technology SaaS platform buying binge. Those technology applications tended to be purchased in the absence of any kind of overarching guiding strategy. I would describe it as buy it and the ROI will naturally happen. I think that after binging on all of these different tech platforms, they were poorly or under implemented and under integrated. And then we threw a scoop of low levels of training. And then we allowed marketing and sales to live and run in technology and data silos. But other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? So Okay, so that's the old playbook when it comes to technology. What does the new playbook look like? Well, you know, as I start thinking about my next startup, I'm thinking a lot about this. Uh, you know, and what 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 does future technology look like? Um, 
you know, so you, honestly, John, you probably see more about kind of this consolidation and some of those other trends. I, I actually, I'm going to leave that for you to comment on. And, you know, I'll focus on where I've been thinking about, you know, these days, which is just, you know, artificial intelligence and AI. Please. Um, you know, as, you know, something which I think has the opportunity to truly fundamentally transform, uh, you know, how we think about all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, if we just sort of use um, cars as like an analogy, you know, if, if you know, old playbook is your regular car, um, you know, then, you know, sort of the second generation, you might argue something like a Tesla, right? Which is, it's still a car, right? It's, it, it has a four wheels and a steering wheel and a driver, but it's using um, a lot of really cool advanced technology to do things that regular cars can't do. Um, but that's still not the next gen full self-driving where this autonomous thing picks you up and there's no steering wheel and you just get in the backseat and there's like a movie theater and, <laughs> you know, and you can, you know, um, you know, and, and so I think we're, we're, we're at an evolution right now where I think we're starting to see the Tesla of you know, Marjack, if you will. Driver you know, assist, but not. Yeah, yeah. you know, and, and that's like when people talk about it. AI today is your co-pilot, not your autopilot. Um, but eventually we're going to get to the full autopilot. And I think an interesting question is, you know, what's it going to take to get there and how long is it going to take? Yeah. But what, more than, yeah. but fund, fundamentally, this is going to have some deep, deep, profound transformations in, in how, you know, in the playbook. In, in, and, and I think also in terms of how marketers can use best practices, you know, so, so anyway, I'm thinking a little bit about this, uh, you know, but, but happy to hear any closing thoughts you have on tech. Yeah. Well, you know, I, first of all, totally agree with everything you said. And I think in, if you come back to the present tense, I think, I think your, your forward looking prediction is right. The question is how long, how hard, and I would add like, what are we, what are we going to do when, when it gets here? But Meanwhile, what do, what is our target? What does our audience today listening to us do now? And I think there's a couple of just sort of pragmatic things that I would recommend. One is relative to your technology platforms and your tool set, give yourself explicit permission to take a fresh look at your tech stack. That's what's happening. Like the tech consolidation, P pick the reason why you could choose because of um, the, the the mandate for efficient growth. You could choose because of ter um, organizational turnover or lack of training. Whatever your reason, give yourself permission to 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 fall out of love and not just in love <laughs> with your tech platforms. No, and then what do you do now? Now I'm I'm a little able to imagine a different tech stack or changes in my tech stack. One is I would make your go to market strategy and your growth play. Those growth plays, John and I've been talking about. Use your updated go-to-market strategy and growth play strategy as your guide to tell you what technology you need. Not just buy what you think is cool, buy what you actually need to execute your go-to-market strategy. Sounds like a great idea, right? Secondly, now that you're doing that, as you're doing that, you will now be able to discern what are my must-have core platforms, what are my nice-to-have platforms. You're going to have to see a continuum. Some things you're going to see, I don't even need that anymore. You also might find technology where you're like, why do I have 40 seats? I only need five. So they, you can really save some money. You're going to make your CFO happy. But you're also going to find some core platforms. You're like, holy shit, I either don't have that and I need to go get a different or additional core platform or I do have it and we need to actually get good at that, either in-house and or with a partner. Last thing I would say is adopt Learn and adopt a RevOps mindset. And I, John, you and I might agree or disagree about this. I didn't say change your org chart. I didn't say go hire a VP of RevOps and stick yeah, everybody like on. But bring a mindset of this idea of like, if I'm going to go execute soccer, like John Miller's telling me I should do, it's going to be a lot harder if my tech and data is siloed in marketing versus SDR versus sales versus CS. So RevOps comes along and says, hey, man. You don't have to change your org chart, but start blending, properly integrating, and thinking about your tech and data stack and analytics through a one revenue team perspective versus silos. So those are some pieces. I mean, th those, and we can talk to reach out to me if you want to. I can give you some more specific, like what to do with your use case. 
That's All right, stuff. so we, we've done it. So we've gone through the eight pillars. We've talked to you about what the old playbook looks like. We've talked to you about what the new playbook looks like, pillar by pillar. Before I pivot into quick lightning round, a couple of questions that I want to end the, uh, the, the, the interview with. Is there anything about the playbook, about what you and I have talked about, any kind of key themes that just come up for you, John? I think we hit the highlights, to, to, to be honest. You know, it, it's, it's, I, the, the main just thing I'll, I'll come back with, though, is you know, I, I don't. You know, I don't want to be the guy who's just saying, oh, you know, this is what you should do. And also, oh, and it's going to be easy. <laughs> you know, this is, a, this is a great point. This is a great I point. I want to You're acknowledge being... that yeah. this is hard. Yes. You know, that that changing how other executives think about brand investments is hard, you know, especially given the average tenure of the CMO, you know, that change. Like if you work at a private equity company, it's not so easy just to come along and say, I'm not going to track marketing source pipeline anymore. <laughs> You know, folks. Um, so I guess I guess that's the takeaway here is like acknowledge that like I believe this is the direction we need to be moving in. I believe this is hard, and I hope by doing podcasts like this and talking about it, you know, it's forming you know a movement that eventually will support marketers to move in the direction we need to move. I love that is such a great place to end this old play. Is 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 a big fat dose of pragmatic realism. <laughs> Uh, thank you. That's great. All right. I'm going to, we're going to go into lightning round now. Um, lightning round, you know how it works. It's hard, easy to say, hard to do. I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to, you don't have to overthink it. Just l let it go. All right. So name one trend within B2B marketing and go to market that you think our field is not paying enough attention to currently. Let me say our field. Yeah. Like this oh, B2B oh, growth oh. geeks. Yeah. Uh, first reaction is, you know, as much as we're paying attention to AI, you know, um, you know, it's funny, there's a trend here where we tend to sort of over F over emphasize or overestimate the impact something has in the short term yeah. and underestimate the impact it will have in the long term. And I think that's exactly where what's going on, you know. That's awesome. That's just like, that's, that's fantastic. All right. One, I, we're going to, this is going to be hard, but just stay with me. Uh, you have been a CEO, a CMO, a CPO, a C3PO, an AFL CIO. Um, you are very qualified to give this advice. I'd like you to give one piece of advice for the CMO, but how the CMO can have a higher quality, more effective relationship with the following C-suite executives. So they're all, it's the, the, the mission here is how can a CMO improve her or his relationship with I'll go first. CEO. One piece of advice. Well, I mean, I think it's true for all of these, right? Ah, you know, okay. I, which is, I mean, so I, I will have this kind of the, the generally the, the, the same advice. Okay. Um, which is as a mark as marketers, I, we don't spend enough time, I think, marketing our marketing internally. Um, and as and I've alluded to enough time, you know, really bringing the insights and the data to help people understand, you know, what's happening in marketing and how it's changing and how marketing actually works. So, you know, the, the one piece of advice is, you know, that's a big part of your job <laughs> is kind of, you know, that peer to peer communication, education. Um, and, you know, you, you know, they're, you know, you have to do it in a way that's going to have them lean in. Right. And not just like, Hey, here's, here's John coming talking about the way marketing works again, you know, <laughs> Uh, so it's, as I said, it's, it's a different set of skills potentially, but yeah. it's, it's really, I think it's, it's what's going to make the winners in the next decade. You're right. I was about to, I was about to force you to answer that for CEO, CRO, SDR leader, CFO, CPO. But I think your answer is right. I think you're like, for all of them, learn how to market your marketing. And you didn't say sell your marketing. You said market your marketing, which is education and engagement. Yep. Not. Okay. Um, XL explosion, XLG explosion, the XLG explosion, meaning product led growth, community led growth, near bound, outbound, ABX. This explosion of go to market motions, in your opinion, is it truly new or is it just new names for an old thing or is it a bit of both? Um, 
I think there, there's, there's always value in naming something that exists already, you know, and like putting a structure and a framework onto things. Um, so, you know, so yeah, yes, <laughs> it is both, right? You know, I, people have marketed with partners before in the past. Um, you know, at, you know, our first product at Marketo, you could come to our website and fill out a credit card, you know, enter your credit card number and start using it. Lo and behold, that's product like growth, you know? <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, a lot of these things have been around, but, but at the same time, by naming it, by defining it, by codifying it, you know, I think you can kind of, you know, bring the best practices more to bear and bring the discipline forward. So, you know, I, I'm not against, you know, whatever the sort of the, the, the next thing is, because everybody's trying to do the same thing, which is, you know, let's help everybody do better. And then the other factor, which I don't think enough discussion goes into, is like not every business is the same. We sell different kinds of products at different price points to different potential personas with different kinds of sales cycles. And the reality is, you know, it's not one size fits all, you know, and so it's, it's okay to have PLG and ABM and demand gen, et cetera, because, you know, they're really just all flavors of go to market. That's right. That's fantastic. All right. Last question to round it out. Um, kind of, I want kind of want to take it home a little bit. Um, how do you get out of work mode and take care of yourself, given uh, our, you're so busy, we're so busy, work is all encompassing. How do you take care of yourself? How do you get out of your head? Sure. Well, you know, I mean, there is some research, you know, that, that you know, a lot of entrepreneurs are pretty good at compartmentalization, you know, um, and, and I think that is a, uh, an important survival skill set. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think I, first of all, just, I have that ability to kind of, you know, oh, okay, now, now it's time for something else. You know, working out, working out is important to me. I make time every day to work out since the pandemic started. You know, I was doing yoga almost every day. Now it's at least four or five times a week. Um, and then my vice is I still kind of end my day usually by making a cocktail and, and, and something about like, I'm making the cocktail, the day's over. There is, there's a bit of a transition moment there for me too. That's fantastic. Um, I think I might be running that playbook myself, my friend. Um, Man, you uh, you know how to do this. I really appreciate your time, John. Thank you for you know it's a great conversation. Thanks for kind of pushing me to push the talking points forward. Yeah, man. All right. Well, uh, we'll let you go. And uh, thanks again for being on Growth Driver. Cheers. We just said goodbye to John Miller, and I'm sitting here. If it's not obvious, the the experience and the expertise that shines through when you hear him talk about old playbook, new playbook. Uh, that just is like screams off the, off the page. Um, you know, I think there's, I was trying to take notes feverishly during that conversation. Um, first of all, really understanding and being able to explain to your internal audience, the reasons behind why the old playbook isn't working as well as it used to, and why there's a need for a new playbook. I think that's really important to go back and listen to. I thought there were some really great points about, hey, I'm not just randomly doing different things or recommending different things as the CRO or the CMO of this company. Buying behavior has changed. We have tended to over-rotate on bottom of the funnel, demand capture, demand conversion. And the cost of us doing that over time looks like this. Um, educating uh, your internal audience uh, as a peer. Um, not, not lecturing or not avoiding the conversation, but really leaning in with those softer skills he talked about. I thought that was really great. Um, gosh, uh, bringing out the fire uh, framework around um, a modern approach to lead and account uh, prioritization and scoring. I thought that was great. And how to use that framework, that fire framework uh, for how you think about data. I think that was really great. I didn't know that that came from Everstring. I thought that was a, I thought that was a John Millerism. I thought that was cool that he uh, gave them attribution and credit for that. I think the point about marketers and CMOs in particular need to um, prioritize. He called it marketers need to market their marketing. <laughs> you know, prioritizing the doing. It's not optional. It's actually a critical part of leadership and change management, especially during these 
shifting times when you have to lead the change of a new, more effective, more efficient playbook. I thought that was really insightful. I could, I could go on and on. Um, oh, his point about AI, that quote where he said, AI is like a lot of fundamental shifts that roll through a, a market. We tend to overestimate the impact it will have in the short term and dramatically underestimate the impact it'll have in the long term. I thought that was really great. And I also want to just give a big shout out to the whole Growth Driver team, Brianna, Jeremy, Doug, Ben, Josh, and my co-hosts, Mike and Anne Marie. Thank you so much. And uh, just in case you forgot, Growth Driver is brought to you by the talented and kind people at Intelligent Demand. Go visit them at intelligentdemand.com and schedule a conversation with a growth expert. Okay, everybody. Talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.